Let me introduce our guest, Robert Arthur. Uh, welcome to the show, Rob. Hi, Gerald. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you on. Glad we uh, finally connected there. We had a, a confusion, I guess, over the time last, uh, was it last week, I think you were booked, right? Well, we didn't have a confusion. I had a confusion, but that's kind of you to say to use the we. Your specialty is uh, land rights, and uh, I guess you've got the same thing going on up there in Canada, eh? Well, I don't know that I would claim my specialty as land rights per se, but uh, I have been studying the law quite extensively, and some of what I've been uncovering is being used for land rights. And uh, specifically, I'm in uh, southwestern Ontario here, or Ontario anyways, um, for the purpose of trying to help some farmers stop the government from coming in and taking land for a, what is essentially going to be a private highway. It's a, an extension of a toll highway, but they claim it'll be a toll highway, but it'll be owned by the people of Ontario, but they did that with the last portion and then uh, sold it to an Italian conglomerate, so now nobody's gaining any benefit at all. And up here, we're a little bit peeved about that kind of thing. We, uh, we prefer benefits like that to go to the population. If you'd like a little bit of background, what have, uh, essentially what I found up here is the power that a claim of right has. And uh, it seems to be effective or at least found in just about every common law jurisdiction. And uh, the power of it is, as an example, there was a young kid down in New Zealand. And in New Zealand, apparently they were going through, uh, corporations would come in, look at some land, want the land, offer a, a, enough money on it that the tax rate would shoot through the roof, but not enough that the people would want to accept it. Uh, that, you know, a lot of this was uh, Maori land and traditional land. And they would say no, but then they couldn't afford the, the uh, property taxes. So they would get kicked off, and the corporation would then come in and in cahoots with the municipalities, uh, buy the land far cheaper. So uh, this one kid, he ended up going on what is essentially crown land up here, or common land. And he built a small house, and the developers in the municipality didn't like that. They took him to court. Court ordered him to tear down his house or he would go to jail. He didn't know what to do, spoke to a friend of mine down there, and crafted and served a, what is called a claim of right. And uh, he went back in 30 days later. He hadn't torn down his house, and the judge asked him why. And he ended up showing him the claim of right that he had served. He pointed out that in the criminal code uh, of New Zealand, or what they call the Crimes Act 1961, that uh, property held under a claim of right can be defended using whatever level of force is necessary, even against persons legally entitled to that property. Then he pointed out that uh, the definition of theft was the removal of property without a claim of right, pointed out that the judge didn't have one, and if he tried removing his property, he'd be committing fraud and theft and all sorts of stuff. And the judge immediately returned his order overturned his own order and uh, a bunch of Maoris down there have been uh, protecting their property this way and on October 18th I believe uh, they are doing it en masse their entire nation is going to be serving a notice of understanding and intent and a claim of right so there, uh, there's huge things happening and it's a matter I found of looking for remedy instead of reasons to keep fighting or pointing fingers this law is actually Something that's international, or that isn't. What I found that it developed because in uh, the Criminal Code of Canada, if you look at Section 38 and 39, it looks at holding property under a claim of right and holding property not under a claim of right. If you have a claim of right, you can use whatever level of force is necessary, even against persons who have a legal right to it. If you don't, you can't. So uh, under that, you can see that a claim of right is a lawful excuse for engaging in an action that otherwise would be an unlawful action. Then you look to section 126 and 127 of the criminal code and it will tell you that you do have the right to disobey any court or any government statute if you have a lawful excuse. And when you read that section, it's quite funny the way they put it in there. If, if they were reading it in, in the town in the center kind of thing, screaming it out loud, They'd be going, anyone who, <laughs> without lawful excuse. <laughs> and then they talk about the punishments that could come to you. They don't want you to know what is and is not a lawful excuse. And a lawful excuse, if you look in the, you now look to New Zealand uh, uh, Crimes Act, and you find the exact same section, it's, slightly, it's worded slightly differently, and what they change is they change the without lawful excuse to without claim of right. 
Well, I don't know how it was up in Canada, but now uh, local townships all over the U.S., uh, you know, if you're a senior citizen and you don't have your house willed officially, if you don't, and, you know, a lot of seniors, they can't even afford to go through the legal proceedings to do this. Oh, yeah. No, uh, yeah. There's a big problem. They'll take your house. Oh, up in, it's even worse. They're not even waiting till you die up in Alberta. They've got this thing where they, uh, people come in and will declare a, uh, a senior citizen as incompetent, and once you're so declared, then those people have the right to your, your property and to administer, administer it for you. But they will pick you up and lock you in a, an old folks' home, and if you try to leave, they treat you like a prisoner, and uh, it's, it's amazingly sickening up here. But you know, and of course, even if you do have the house willed, if you become that way here, you know, incompetent, yeah, they pretty much do the same thing. Uh, well, they won't come in and force you, but they, they pressure you. And then once you're in there, you can't bequeath your, your home because uh, they'll drain your assets. Or they'll to claim pay that for you will what you were incompetent at the time. But again, yeah, if, if you put in a nursing home, yeah, they'll drain. Go ahead. Uh, again, there's always remedy, and uh, to look at what they're doing and then just get angry about it without looking for the remedy, I think doesn't really help anyone. Right. Uh, and I think there, I, at least what I have found in law here, and a lot of my studies was a result of looking what, uh, at what was in the United States and then looking for uh, similarities here. Uh, so a lot of people look at the stuff that I try to teach, and they say, well, is it applicable here? And yet it's, it's down there where I, I first learned about most of the stuff, including uh, the claim of right and the notice of understanding and intent. Wow. So do you have anything for, uh, well, this would apply, I guess, to seniors too, right, that have this problem, you know, that they get their home taken away? And Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I don't this think is that it wouldn't. And uh, I know that other people are using it up here for, well, just about everything. They're using it to discharge student loans. They're using it to uh, deal with demands made by the courts or by uh, the CRA, the revenue agency up here. Uh, and there's always been remedy, but one of their tricks is to get us to, to fight them. They entice us to fight them, and they make us think that that's the way that we are going to succeed. And I look at it kind of like uh, playing football. If your goal is to get the ball across the goal line, why spend all your time and energy trying to fight the people between you and that goal line? Ideally, you want to beat them and, and avoid them completely. I've, uh, I've got a website, and uh, we do have packages available, but I've also made all of the stuff that you can get in the package available free online. Because uh, to me, I mean, I can tear down all of the fences that surround myself, but if I'm surrounded by people who have erected their own fences, how free am I? And uh, it's thinkfree.ca, and we have a forum up there as well, and uh, there's uh, a lot of people achieving a great deal of good up here anyways. And what we have found is that when you go through the process properly, the people that normally you might fear, like the peace officers, they're not your enemy. You don't treat them as your enemy. And if you can just show them the path, because these people, they wouldn't accept an order to go beat up a toddler. They, they wouldn't accept that order because they know it's unlawful. If you establish certain, if you serve a notice of your understanding and intent and a claim of right, and you do it through a notary public, you can create a situation where any order from a, a, a court against you would be unlawful, and they would have a duty to know this. So it's, a, it's about us trying to educate them and doing it without, uh, without the fear and without the anger and without pointing fingers at them. When you treat peace officers like that up here anyway, some of them, I'm sure you, there's bad apples everywhere. Oh, yeah, yeah. respond quite positively. Okay, welcome back to Two Thirds Radio. It's your host, uh, Charlie Giuliani. We're joined by uh, Robert Arthur. You know, I was just looking on your website here. Are you there, Rob? Yes, I am. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was just looking on your website, and I noticed you've got quite a few uh, uh, things here on uh, tickets, you know, speeding tickets, quote, speeding violations. This is something that a lot of people aren't aware of. Uh, and, again, I don't know the laws up in Canada, but I'm assuming from what you've got here that it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, they don't have the right to, uh, to uh, give you uh, speeding tickets. There's no law. You know what I – one of the things that I figured out, I mean – Look at the, can anyone cut your hair, Charles, without your consent? If I came at you with scissors and tried to cut your one hair on your head without your consent, would that be assault? Yeah. 
it's sure. like I, I, no one can cut your hair. We can't paint your house. How can anyone do anything without your consent? And they use words, and these words they use actually mean something, and we, we are conditioned to not really look at the true meanings. They will say, I'm giving you a ticket. What if you're not accepting gifts? What if you didn't bring anything for them? And if they then say, oh, well, I'm giving it to you anyways, it's not a gift, it's an imposition. But if they can go to court and say, yes, I gave him a ticket, and at no point do you dispute the fact that it was a gift, then uh, they've got you right there pretty much. And I've, yeah. heard, I've gotten out of, you know, cops giving me tickets merely by saying I'm not accepting any gifts. And they, they were a little bit stimmied, and they realized that it does require consent. And well, what I appear... It's like the income tax in this country requires consent. It's voluntary. Government requires consent. If you look at it, you've got a House of Representatives. Look at the law. No one can be your representative without your consent. They've got evidence of your consent by the way of your signature on documents with the word submission application and registration. And that's how they prove their consent. But using a notice of understanding and intent with a notice of understanding, what you're doing is you're establishing a common ground that you can then later point to in court if necessary. You express your intent to give them an opportunity to dispute it if they don't like it, and if they don't, it's accepted as lawful by both parties. Then you operate on a claim of right, and uh, I'm pretty sure if you were to look into your own, uh, I haven't looked into the, uh, the code down there, but I would be willing to bet that you will find it in there. Do a search for a claim of right, and these people operate upon uh, your consent or your appearance of consent, and then if you go and you try to revoke that consent, but you don't do it properly, uh, yeah. it will be seen as no not happening. Uh, just sound there's like a strange. lot of people that uh, claim to help you out of the tax system that way, and then you, you wind up getting yourself in a big trap because you don't do it the right way. You've got to know what you're doing. It's all a word game, and it's, it's most of it is just legal fiction that they get you to consent. I mean, if you point to the Constitution, that is what you are pointing to, then, as your notice of understanding. But in this game of law, you have every right in the world to craft a notice of understanding of your own and place it on top of that Constitution, and before they can point to it, it's like a card game. They have to deal with this one you just put down. And yeah. if not, this one starts legally and lawfully. It will have just as much force. Uh, According to you, it becomes your law, your constitution. And right, uh, because they, they do that. They'll, they'll twist it around and say, no, it means this. And Yeah, and if you craft it yourself, then you're the, you're the author of the writ. You have the authority. You get to define the words that you've used. And what I found down in the States was uh, people who would take try to t sue each other, they'd go to court, and the judges would ask to see the notices and see the claims. So I was, you know, curious as to what notices and claims. And then sure enough, people used to actually talk to each other and treat each other civilly before they ran to court with a bunch of lawyers in tow. And they would serve a notice of their understanding, a notice of their intent, and then claim the right after these had gone through the process where the uh, receiving party didn't dispute or deny. And yeah. that was the case. The judge had to see it as this was the law. And this is still the case, at least up in Canada, in New Zealand, in Australia. And I'm sure if you stood, stood your ground down in the States, you'd find it. Because these, these people can't be your representative without your, your consent. They're not your representative because they're your government. They are your government because you allowed them to be your representative. And up here, and it's probably the same thing down in the States with your social security number. We have a social insurance number. All you have to do is look at it, and this number establishes you as an agent of the federal government. They are your employer. You are their employee by virtue of this number, and all of the rules that they enforce, which have the words act in it, these are rules that are applicable to the government agents and employees. You can abandon that number just like you can quit working at Walmart, and if you do that, the rules that they've generated for all the, all the employees are no longer applicable to you. Now, it's a tough road to hold just yet because very few people realize this, but uh, again, if you serve notice of understanding and intent and you operate on a claim of right, then you create a situation where they can't possibly bring charges, and as long as you're not being, you know, a, an angry Yahoo about it, they have better things to do, and they don't want to try to stop you anyways, and the, the peace officers end up liking you.
If you register your kids, you are actually creating a legal entity that you associate with your offspring. You're abandoning ownership of that entity and allowing the government to seize it by the act of registration. So at that point, they can start making whatever demands they want that you care for the person within a certain parameter. And if we got to take a short break. Hold that thought. I'll be right back. Hey, welcome back to the Fist Radio. But uh, Robert Atheron is our guest. Talking about setting yourself free from the legal fictions that have enslaved people to the point where, you know, people don't even stand up or sit down. It's like you're back in the classroom again, and you've got to raise your hand just to use the bathroom. Uh, they've gotten us so thoroughly uh, brainwashed, literally. And it's all been done by our consent. That's what's so astonishing. They fool people so much that they, they have no, unknowingly given over their right to even, yeah, use the bathroom without consent. And, of course, to use the bathroom, uh, so to speak, you've got to have a permit. You've got to shell out money to do everything today. So they make you pay for your enslavement. It's a function of law, Charles. Uh, you can't point to a body of words, claims it give, claim it gives you authority, and then not know what the words mean because you're speaking nonsense. You're pointing to something that has no sense for you and using it for claiming authority. And it, it, in a common law jurisdiction, you can't do that. So um, you're going beyond that. Yeah, and what I found is uh, if you look at, and I'm pretty sure it works down there, I, I use a, a essentially commercial law in this, in this uh, example or in this case because what they are doing is they're trying to give you a bill of exchange. If you look at a violation ticket, at least up here, and the ones that I've looked at down south, I think one came from Texas, one from uh, Florida, they all match the definition as well. And they get you into dishonor by the way you treat that violation ticket, that, that bill of exchange. If you identify yourself as a human being and not a fiction, point it out as a bill of exchange, and they issue it to you anyways, uh, or they, they fail to give you the original, they impose a copy on you, and they don't give you the three days grace that you are supposed to have under the Bills of Exchange Act, uh, you can send that off to the third party who would be demanding payment. You take it to a notary public. They protest it for lack of proper presentment. You were never given a proper bill to deal with. All they gave you was a copy. You take that to the notary public. You send it to the third party, the Minister of Finance in this case up here. They have three days to either represent the original or they have to prove that the original was lawfully presented according to the act. And if they don't do that within the three days, guess who's liable for that, that bill of exchange? They are. The cop who endorsed it. And they know this. And now up here people are doing this process, and I've heard of hundreds of people, at least in D.C., they go through, they say, I'm a human being, not a fiction, that's a bill of exchange, and I invite you peacefully to present the original so I can lawfully deal with it. If they don't do that, you go through the process, You don't. it doesn't cost you a penny, a bit of, of problem, but what they're doing now is they just shut their book and say, I've already ran your name through the computer, I'll have to give you a warning. Take this opportunity to be nice to the cop, to educate them, but next time they run your name through the computer, there's red flags, they don't want to stop you. And I just, uh, the last time I left, Last month, actually, a month and a bit ago, I drove from Vancouver to Calgary in an unregistered automobile with a, a plate on the back that said, free man on the land. We passed six or seven cops. They didn't stop us, but I had sort of notice on them, let them know that I was doing this, let them know what my position was, expressed to them my intent, did it with a notary watching, and then claim the right to do so. And uh, it's the law. It becomes the law. The reason they can point to all the statutes that they do is because that is their notice of understanding and you haven't put anything on top of it. If you read it carefully, it's a notice of understanding and intent. Nobody has knowingly agreed to these stipulations. They've been imposed upon them and they blindly think they have to because it's, quote, the law, but they've never got their consent and, and not their knowledge. Either. They use funny words. They use words like, you must apply. And they will tell you that the word must creates an obligation on your part. And then you will step forth and then apply. But if you look at the definition of the word must and apply, if a, it must can be either a directive or an imperative. An imperative might create an obligation on you. A directive merely defines conditions which, if you voluntarily fulfill, will uh, give me authority over you. If I tell you, you must come to my party through the front door, 
This creates no obligation to attend my party, but defines that which, if you do it voluntarily, will let me claim I have authority over you because you are in my party. And that's what they do. They get you to apply. They get you to submit. They get you to register. And it is with Willingly. those words. It's with those words that they gain the authority, the creation, and the authority over your person. And uh, I've learned more about the law, I think, by looking at the Bible and the teachings of Jesus Christ and how he would act. And I've asked myself, how would Jesus Christ act? Would he, would he go and apply? Would he beg? Because that's what you're doing when you're applying. Would he submit? Would he register? I don't think he would do any of those things. And when you reinterpret the Bible in some of the places, uh, I've used his teachings in court to shut down the court, bring it to a screeching halt. Uh, specifically, where they state, uh, where he states, if you're on your way to court with, with your adversary, offer amends before you get there, otherwise you will be seized and you can go to jail. Up here, if you offer amends prior to going to court and they refuse your offer, they refuse any discussion, uh, you can merely point that out and you win automatically, or you just point out that there has been no discussion, no negotiation, and therefore this is not a court of competent jurisdiction, because a court of competent jurisdiction and a common law jurisdiction requires that. So you point out the lack of that and the judges turn white, they yell at the prosecutor, and then it gets shut down, and now you're in a position of discussion and negotiation. And if you ask to discuss, and they refuse, how do you know what amends to offer? The, the offer mm -hmm. doesn't have to be accepted. It only has to be made. And, of course, uh, there's the, what's called void for vagueness clause. I don't know if you have something like that up in Canada. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a, a function yeah. of law as well. You can't be compelled to do the impossible. And uh, it's things that are way too vague are fall outside the... Uh, uh, well, it, it starts to become impossible. And uh, plus um, the other aspect, no one would would be seen to agree to something that vague. And, and nothing could be more vague than the IRS code, and yet people are compelled every day, they, without even question, they just sign over one-third of their hard-earned money, which is theirs. They worked for it. They earned it. It's their money. And they're signing. I mean, this is legal theft. They've kept them so brutal. You will find that each and every one of those likely have a social security number, which they begged for. And that's how they get them. So, you know, I, I, hear, I hear the problem. I certainly hear the frustration and the anger that it generates. But when you look at how they actually do it, they rely on on us going and getting a social insurance number or social security number. And yet, if you look at the code up here, there's nothing stopping you from abandoning that number. And that's what people are doing up here. And now when they send, when CRA comes at them, they say, sorry, I don't even have a, a social insurance number anymore. And uh, I can't even fill out your documents. And we've got court rulings up here where they, because there was no social insurance number, no legal joinder between the, the person and the social insurance number, that there was no obligation. The obligation is held to an account. The account really has the obligation, and that's the number. And yeah. uh, Abandon your number. They can't do anything. They have no mechanism sure. anymore. Now, down here, that number, Social Security, they call it down here, of course, uh, you, it's imposed on you from the time you're born. You don't apply for that. It's given to you. And so by the time you're of legal age... Your parents you just, signed for it. Your parents well, 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 yeah, that's through yeah. registration. And they were right. acting as your agent uh, at the time. But there is right. nothing at law that says that you have a duty to be associated with the number. And if you serve your notice of understanding and your intent and you claim the right to exist free of that number, you will find that they have nothing with which they can grab you. It's kind of like they, they've been told anyone wearing a rain jacket you can affect, but you can't stop people from taking it off. And if you take it off, run around me essentially, as, as Jesus said, like a child, be unregistered, be naked of your person, and they have nothing to touch to. Nothing. Yeah. What I, what I uh, try to teach people to do up here, in a, instead of arguing with them and getting angry about it, you do what is called a conditional acceptance. Whatever claims they make, and it could be something along the lines of them claiming the right to poke you in the eye with a sharp, pointy stick. If you say, okay, I conditionally accept your offer, and then you apply your conditions upon proof of claim that it's not going to harm me, and I want to test that by poking you in your eye twice with the same <laughs> stick. 
You put right, it back right. on them with no anger, and you, it, it doesn't matter what their, what their demands are. What matters then well, is how yeah, you respond I mean, and what conditions you attach, and there is no conflict because all you are doing is discussing and negotiating. Hey, it's, yeah, it's the first time I've been uh, um, on your uh, network here. I was listening to the gentleman there. Uh, yeah, I've been kind of in this uh, uh, movement, I guess you say, for probably 25 years, and there's been a lot of people who have been flushed down the toilet here uh, in the lower 48 using the UCC argument, and I... I don't know, for instance, uh, it was rejected in the United States versus uh, Stockland, the United States versus Green Street, the United States versus uh, uh, Kimlick, and these are all federal cases. Uh, I understand the, the concept behind contract between two parties. Uh, so what, what is your author, or the, the, the person here that you're talking to, uh, have to say about some of these cases? These cases were used to... Um, to say that you weren't liable for an income tax under Title 28. And so I, I get a little bit concerned when when people start saying, well, you, uh, you can use this, you can use this, when the court was just totally flushing down the toilet in federal court. Uh, what is your, uh, what is your, the gentleman that's uh, talking about this, what does he have to say about that? My, uh, first of all, I'm not too, you know, I'm not familiar with those cases, so I, I, I certainly wouldn't feel comfortable commenting directly. Uh, but what we're finding up here is that we have in our code the right to disobey any court and the, like, the, you could craft a, uh, a path where it doesn't matter what the courts have said. You don't consent to that. It doesn't matter what the, the code says, what the IRS say, because you don't consent to any of them. And if you do it properly, there's nothing these people can do. Uh, and all of these cases, I'd be willing to bet that not a single one of them had served a notice of understanding and intent and a claim of right or had gone through the process, which is uh, quite easily definable in Australian, New Zealand, Canadian statutes, mm -hmm. uh, at least in the common law. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And what I would... Would you give me a little background information on what what you're talking about with the UCC argument? Because I don't suggest using that. Up here, the UCC is reflected in the PPSA, the Personal Property Security Act, and it is some of the most deceptive stuff out there. So I don't point to that as remedy at all. Right. I, I'm not. I haven't actually gone through and read each case, um, but I know that, uh, I mean, there's there's been a lot of stuff like this, you know, the fringe on the floor. Oh, I'm, I'm just saying something right up front that a lot of times if you lose a case doesn't mean that the law is in favor of the courts and against you. You know, these, these people very often are either ignorant themselves of what the law really is or they're just playing ball or got caught off or something, you, you know. Right. Uh, but even then, they can't beat you if, you know, if you understand that it's all, it's all legal fiction. If you divorce yourself from the system, get out of the Social Security thing, then they don't have that contractual control over you. you you've gotten out of it. That's how they, they, they sucker you in. Anyway, hold with us. Uh, we're going to go to break. We'll be right back. Uh, Jack in Missouri. Um, you still there, Jack? Yeah, I'm hanging in here. Yeah, so um, I forgot where we left off now. You were asking... Uh, oh, yeah, we were talking about... Um, you know, the, the courts and why people lose in some of these cases. Yeah, I'm not too familiar with the, uh, I forgot what the acronym is now, what it stands for, uh, CC. Uniform Commercial Code. Yeah, my understanding is it's a, it's a law uh, in regards to banking contracts. It's essentially the law that refers to commerce if you wish to operate with limited liability. Mm -hmm. If you want to engage in a profit-making endeavor, and you wish to do it with the limited liability that is presently offered, then this is the body of words that w is going to be governing you. Mm. What the international bankers go by, you mean? Oh, yes. Bankers, yeah. uh, even, I mean, there, there are people up here who are uh, trying to use it to claim they're strong and uh, do all sorts of stuff. But essentially, it's in order so that, not so that you can engage in commerce, but so you can do it without liability and without full responsibility. Uh, you, you can still engage in commerce. You just have to be responsible for your actions. Right. What's important, if I may, Charles, that people oh, can sure, yeah. get in trouble by asserting their rights without first. I mean, you don't build a house without building a foundation. Yeah. You need to dig your foundation, and you need to do that with a notice of understanding properly served on the, on the parties affected so that 
if you ever do end up in court against these people, you've got something that you can point to. Then you express your intent again, give them time to come, and then express to you what their intent is so that all the cards are on the table. And if they don't respond and they don't because of the power of your notice of your understanding, then you can claim the right, and then you can assert your rights. And if you do it properly, at least up in the... I think we're pretty lucky up here in Canada, although I found the exact same sections in the Notary Act in Florida and uh, and uh, Texas. So I'm pretty sure you're going to find the same level of remedy available to you there. Thankfree.ca for Canada. Now, what you're saying is just, you know, this, this notice of uh, understanding... Basically, you you know, you don't even need a lawyer, do you, with that? No. I've seen some where it was so simple where the guy tried to study the law, and I've studied the law. I've got a good brain for it. I've been gifted that way. He had a really good heart, and he couldn't figure it out. And I said, don't worry about it. Just express your understanding. And his level of understanding was, I believe that love, compassion, and truth is my law. I, uh, I looked in your statutes, couldn't find those words anywhere. Therefore, these statutes cannot be my law. The old system simply isn't going to work, and what is going to happen? I'm quite happy about it, because what I see happening is all of the deceivers are going to be bound in the cages that they themselves created with their own words. And everyone else who wants to step free are going to be free to do that. And it is a word game. Yeah, and there we're going to be. It's going to be very easy to identify them, and they'll never be able to step out because if they do, they're stepping into the liability of our own courts, of our own justice system. So, my brother, we discharged sixty-seven and a half million dollars worth of student loans using this process, using a notice of understanding and intent and a claim of right, and it boils down to one fundamental truth: before God, we're all equal. And no one, no one can govern you without your consent. No one can provide adjudication services without your consent. If you look at the courthouses up here, at least in British Columbia, uh, the sign on the door used to say court hours. Then that changed to hours of operation. Now it reads business hours. This is a business they're doing. It's all about money, and they are at least now waking up and recognizing that they need your consent, and if they try to impose it, I was arrested once for uh, contempt of court, and I told the judge that I was a free man on the land. He was abducting me under the color of law. I did not consent to this. He turned white, and I was out of there 45 minutes later. <laughs> and you just lay it off. These are just human beings using words, and if you create your own words, put them on top of theirs and say, well, before you start using yours against me, let's deal with these. It's a game. It's a game. It At any time, you can just say, no, I'm done. I'm walking away. And what they want you to do is stand against them, show them your fist, and say, I'm going to fight, and I'm going to be angry, and I'm going to bring all this energy to bear. But it doesn't win. It never wins. It's exactly what they want. And all you have to do is say, no, nope, sorry, I'm not playing with you. No, like the whole, you know. All of government operates like this, doesn't it? It's, it's just an intimidation game, and you have to out-intimidate them by showing that you're not... No, you don't. No, you don't have to out-intimidate them at all. You just have to laugh at them. Well, I mean, that's what winds up happening, though. Yeah, well, they want you to try playing the out-intimidation game. Just stand there and smile at them and laugh at them and let it be a puppy. <laughs> but ideally, you want to bring peace. Eh? I mean, it says right. blessed to be right. the peacemakers, not blessed be the most intimidating. The way I look at it, I, I draw an analogy about a nanny, and a lot of people will refer to it as a nanny state. And imagine for a moment it is a nanny state. If you are pooping your pants and bringing poo all over places where everyone walks, they can and will put a diaper on you. If you're throwing a tantrum, they can and will put you in your room until you settle down. If you're rebellious, they'll put a turf you on you and they will enforce it. But if you get to the point where you grow up and you say, listen, Nanny, I'm not doing any of these things anymore, and I don't need your diaper, I'm not throwing a tantrum, and I'm not rebellious, because guess what? I'm the owner of the house, and you now work for me, and I'm leaving, and I'll be back in the morning, and you'll have breakfast ready, and you give her a tap on the bum, and you leave. When we grow up spiritually, they lose the power. They only have the power when we're pooping or throwing tantrums or being rebellious. Somebody was asking, I was just looking during the break in the chat room, and someone was asking, uh, Robert, you know, if you could cite any cases, specific ones, um, where, you know, this has been successful. I imagine you probably have uh, a great many, right? 
Well, the funny thing is, when it's successful, you, you don't end up in court. So there are no cases to cite. Um, oh, really? Yeah. So it, it ends before they, it even... They will shuffle it right out. If you wanted to look at, there's one specifically, uh, R.V. Lutz. Brian Lutz was uh, charged with failure to file. And that's one of the key cases where they pointed out that uh, the lack of joinder between the number and the person meant the person owed nothing, that, uh, that it was that number that was necessary. And if there is no association established between that number and the individual, there can be no obligation on the individual. And uh, there's certainly nothing out there that says you cannot disassociate or abandon a number. <laughs> So yeah, you know, it, it is a uh, it is a much different than what we have down here. It's the same thing. They entrap you with the number. You call it a, what was it? A social social insurance number. That's insurance it. number. Isn't yeah. And what do you they call it insurance? Yeah. What are you insured of? You're insured that you're going to be exploited. That's your insurance. Well, what it's what they do up here. It used to be called un you needed that number to get unemployment insurance, and then because of a certain court case, I forget which one, they now call it employment insurance. If you go to Human Resources Canada, they call it a federal employment and federal employee identification number, uh, and you need it to pay into a pension plan. And the courts have ruled that payment into a pension plan is prima facie evidence of employee status. So up here, I, what I try to tell people is they're, they're complaining about their government, but it's not really their government they're complaining about. They're complaining about their employer, and if they quit. That employer suddenly has very, very little power, and as long as they're willing to live their life without, without harming another human being, damaging someone else's property, or using fraud or mischief in their contracts, the government has absolutely no power whatsoever. Right. And uh, even the courts up here have, have acknowledged that they need two parties before them, each consenting to, uh, you know, to the adjudication and uh, acknowledging the conflict. And if you are the one who truly put the love in your heart, eh, you're just going to find a path that is going to allow you to avoid the conflict. You use a conditional acceptance, you smile and you laugh at them, and you treat them not like they're a bully, someone you should fear, but like a child that you can pick up and tickle or take off your belt and spank them. Are you a sovereign yourself, uh, uh, I Rob? consider myself to be a free man on the land. And uh, I would claim sovereign status, except I think that to a certain degree that takes away uh, from my duty to God. And I, I think fundamentally God must be seen as sovereign, and I'm a servant of God to a large degree. But certainly I don't have any human being above me claiming higher status. Right. Do so, I mean, you still have your social uh, insurance number? Or? No way. Once you get that number, you have submitted to their authority, and you're making yourself subordinate, and whatever decision they make, you're going to abide by. People don't realize, you know, that that is, that is what it amounts to. Yeah, you're joining a house party, and you can leave the house party. When you leave, you might have to give up certain benefits. You aren't going to get to listen to the music or eat the food. But if they're just playing polka music and force-feeding you a tablet anyways, I mean, <laughs> what sort of benefit is that? If you don't know what you're giving up, in exchange for societal benefits, how do you know what you're getting is a benefit? Would you buy a car and not know what you paid for it and then say, oh, I got a great deal? Boy, but they got people suckered. Well, I, I, to a large degree, I, I think people have brought it on themselves. There is a maximum in law that states, uh, let he who would be deceived be deceived. And yeah. all of the change that you, you, you complain about, these chains of deception, essentially, they're all made from links of our own ignorance, and they're so easy to break. And what I'm starting to see is that it is, in fact, I think it's a process whereby it's necessary for us to do this to become spiritually more aware. And I think you become far more powerful if you, you know, stop bemoaning uh, the fact that there are people out there who have taken advantage of our own sleepiness. And we are being woken up one way or another, yeah. and that's a, a good thing, I think. So uh, I'd rather just concentrate on the, on getting the camp happening and, you know, getting the coffee on. And so people, when they do wake up, they smell something besides just uh, the crying babies. 
and uh, I'm going to show them the process by which they can use a notary public to open up a court and establish that the government simply does not have the right to take this property and uh, empower the cops to refuse any orders contrary to this. It is yeah. absolutely key. Because if you don't do that, these people are going to be in a position where they have no choice. But right. if you can show them that it is just as much a function of law for you to say no to the government and for you to have that right protected by them as it is for you to not get your hair cut by some stranger, show them this and you empower them. Right. They, they were never our enemies. Eh? They were always there. I think peace officers, anyways, have always been there. To play. What I have found up here uh, is speaking with individual peace officers and doing it at peace rallies and uh, camp rallies or, you know, protests of all sorts. Uh, for the most part, they want to see a change just as much as anyone. They have kids. They see what's coming. They don't want their kids to be uh, caught up in the new world order. They have no evidence that their kid is going to be a cop. And, so a lot of them are just as concerned and just as aware. Uh, right, it's right. a matter of showing them the out. It's a matter of giving them the power so that when they come and they give, they are given an order, they can say, no, you're, you're ordering me to kick a puppy, and I'm not kicking a puppy, and you're wanting to even order that. And at least up here, a lot of the judges, they're aware of it. Mind you, we, we've got thousands of people across the country going through this process, hey, Charles. We're just serving our notice, making our claim, and... Uh, the cops are backing off. They, they've been told they, these wow. people are not breaking the law, and as long as no one brings claim against them that they've engaged in unlawful activities, don't treat them as a person. Because up here the criminal code distinguishes between uh, actual crimes, like, a, like uh, say, a B&E or an assault or a robbery or something like that. It refers to anyone who, and anything else, all the other acts, refers to any person who. So in the notice of understanding and intent, you express that you are no longer going to be a person subject to these body of words, but you do recognize that you are in any one. And cops love it to a large degree. You know, I mean, we shouldn't be looking at them as enemies. I'm trying to create a, a place where we look at them as good peace officers. They should have as much esteem as the firefighters. And all they need to do is be educated to the fact that fundamentally we have a right to say no. No, thank right. you. You're a service provider, and I have said no. And I'm not fighting you. I'm not arguing with you. I'm not bitching at you. I'm just turning my back on you, and I'm starving. When you're minding a business, you're just trying to provide for your family, and they're trying to make a criminal out of you. When you're not doing anything, you're not bothering anyone, you're simply not complying with their unreasonable dictates that... Uh, you're not even subject to. There's something wrong with a system like that. Oh, yeah. Anyway, we, they, they've hijacked it. They've taken it over, and you are, for you are not aware that you're a government agent. And yeah. then, because you, you start complaining, but you never look at your real remedy saying, okay, I quit. I'm just not playing anymore. Take right. your ball and go home, and they lose right then. I remember on one of your videos, uh, you mentioned that a uh, policy enforcement agent had pulled you over, and he was looking, I believe, on his laptop. And he was uh, looking at something that he found rather strange. Um, is that something like on the NCIC where they look up your name and it says do not detain release immediately? Yeah, it, it uh, says essentially that I'm a free man and that there should be uh, no, no statutory charges without the express written consent of the Attorney General and the Solicitor General. And they very rarely see that. And from what I understand, a lot of people who are going through this process now if you serve them notice, that's what's coming up on their screens, and they're just, thank you, sir, have a great day. They leave you alone as long as, again, you treat them with respect, and uh, in your understanding, you express that you are trying to create something better for everyone. Yeah, that's great. Right. Short break, folks. We are back. Back on Secrets Radio. So Charlie Giuliani. We've got um, Robert Arthur up in Canada, who's tired of playing foolish games, and it's very easy to stop playing these foolish games. Uh, just stop letting yourself being intimidated and suckered and lied to. Uh, one yeah, thing so I would I, like to mention, Charles. Sure. Uh, in the notice of understanding and intent, one of the reasons these have such power is because it comes along with a thing called the fee schedule. 
wherein you tell them how much you are going to be paid if they insist upon collecting services from you, and you do so under what is called protest and duress. Duress meaning they've got a gun and they are pointing to a body of words. You don't want to fight with them. We'll settle it later. Protest means uh, essentially you're going to fulfill a contract that they're claiming exists, but they have to prove the existence of that contract. If they don't, you get to create that contract. And they only have three days to do it. Uh, what uh, people are doing up here with the fee schedule is, uh, like, for instance, mine, if I am stopped and I'm just educating an officer, I'll take it as an honor. But if they start insisting, uh, I, my fee schedule is $200 an hour. If they put cuffs on me, it jumps to $2,000 an hour. And there are ways to collect it through the notary public here. So once you've gone through that process and it comes up on their screen that uh, you might be personally liable for his fee schedule, and it's 200 bucks an hour and 2000 if you're incarcerated or cuffed, uh, people don't want to start playing that game. They're adding more and more and more stipulations and requirements. And They're forcing you to wake up. It's, look at it as... Look at it as the Spirit of God coming down and operating through these people to get you to the point where it's just too much and you say, okay, I've got no choice, I've got to wake up. Uh, if you look at it like that, it becomes, it, it stops the moment you wake up, you know, the moment you start serving these things. What people are finding here, they might be getting beat on by the government and they hate it, but the moment they serve these documents, and essentially I call it getting out of bed, getting dressed, checking the board for your duties and start mm -hmm. doing that. And when you do that, the people who were guarding you when you were sleeping and who might have brought forth, uh, I mean, we're, we're losing our dreams, right? It's so much easier to lay in bed, nice, comfy and warm, dreaming about uh, Sugar Land and whatnot. But that's not the reality that we're facing. And if you do accept your duties, these people stop beating on you. They, they suddenly look at you with a great deal of respect is what I'm finding. Yeah, sure. Oh, here's someone that actually knows what's going on. We can't sucker him. So what would you recommend? We've got another call. I'm going to go to him in a minute. But what would you recommend? You know, most of our listeners obviously are not uh, out of the system, quote, unquote. They do have, in fact, Social Security or Social yeah. Insurance numbers. You know, unfortunately, it's not as easy for them, is it? No, and they probably have families and jobs in there. And I was in a position where I had very, very little to lose. Uh, and everything to gain by doing it. So I don't really have an answer for that, except people have to look at the truth themselves. It's their own due diligence and uh, examine the situation. And if they think that they're better off getting these benefits, that are I, personally I can never see any benefit from a deception, and it's clearly a deception happening. So I, I don't know how anyone could expect me to accept that that's a, a benefit, but if they consider it a, a benefit or it's just too difficult to get out at the time, a lot of the, I don't know, I think a lot of power comes just by knowing what you can do if you need to, and you will get yeah. these people in government to start serving you better if you come from a position of knowledge and power instead of a position of, uh, of ignorance, essentially. And being a subordinate. Yeah, and who's to be subordinate? I mean, they tricked us. We're supposed to be masters. They're supposed to be servants. They yeah. offered us benefits. We went and begged for those benefits, not knowing that we would then be servants as well in their little game, and they would be the boss of all servants. But now we can say, okay, the game's over, and I'm the master once again, and they will respect that if you do act like a master. People, especially in America, in the, U in the U.S., I should say, are deceived by this idea that we're a free country. And it doesn't matter how much they become enslaved, they still have it in their head that they're free. I mean, what's free about it when you none can't... Are, even, none are more enslaved what do you than those. Want? Yeah, none are more enslaved than those. But also, it's a, you know, and it, I don't know that I would be as comfortable doing what I do down there because there is a much more... Um, government militant type attitude to be nice about it. We, up here in Canada, we, we don't really laugh at you guys. We used to, but now it's getting scary and sad for y'all. You know, I mean, we, we've got, I, I think, far more freedoms up here. And I think we're, the, as a common law jurisdiction, uh, we are quite blessed in what we have available to us and are, are available to respond. But yeah, I think well, we can probably help you guys as well because uh, I know that 
once precedent is set anywhere in the Commonwealth, the courts here will look at it, and likely that might be the truth down in uh, the states as well. There you go. Free, uh, thinkfree.ca, guys. Check one of the very back. we got Dan in Houston waiting patient. Welcome back to Truth Earth Radio. Uh, if you're tired of playing foolish games, definitely check out uh, our guest's website, Robert Arthur's website, which, again, is thinkfree.ca. Very interesting information here that we're discussing. We've got uh, Dan of the Waiting Patiently in Houston on the line. Uh, you still there, Dan? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, mean, I, may have called, okay. I may have called you for the wrong reason. I, did, I was uh, part of your conversation with other speakers. But I, mean, um, I called because um, my son was murdered last year, shot to death, and uh, right. called a suicide. And uh, one of the detectives that invested, he said, well, he didn't think it was a suicide because there was no residue of gun. Uh, that's very strange. I think remedy yeah. would lie somewhere with sitting down, writing all this out in an affidavit format, and taking it before a justice of the peace and seeing what that justice of the peace could do, especially if you're in Texas, from what I understand. Right yeah, well, I'll try that too, yeah. No. With an affidavit in your hand. Yeah, right. Uh, it's not even notarized with request or something? Uh, no, it's just you telling what your truth is, sworn out. Just write it down, you know, and uh, then go talk to the uh, uh, Justice of the Peace. Sit there patiently all day if necessary until uh, there's some time. And uh, uh, talk to them and tell them... Some police officers that are retired and some still working in the homicide. And they're very, very uh, concerned and caring. And one of them told me that he's retired and he's worried about his retirement being messed up if he dares tell me. That's how phony the system is. Well, uh... I don't know. I think you might be able to find some remedy with a good justice of the peace. Maybe there, and you know, I, to a certain degree, you have to trust in the fact that not everyone is bad. Oh, I do agree that these guys have been wonderful, a lot of them, but they just said they can't risk their job. <laughs> Well, put, put it on the record in the in front of a good justice of the peace. Yeah, and, try, uh, try that. Won't even cost you anything. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. I'll try it. All right, thanks. Yeah, but uh, again, the, the remedy must be, I think it has to come from us. When all yeah. is said and done, if we can find a path that allows them to be a little bit less lazy and to recognize that their duty, uh, I don't know, I see pretty exciting times coming. And if it spreads properly, uh, we might just have a, a lot of remedy available to us, and we'll find that. Well, what peaceful means. Yeah, have you ever worked in like a, a union kind of thing where the union boss then comes up and says, here, this is you work a little bit slower? I mean, we might have some very good peace officers out there who are frustrated by the system and want to do better, and all we have to do is give them an opportunity to do so. And uh, that is often the most difficult thing, eh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Forgiveness. It's, we're looking for the truth because it's the truth that's going to set us free. And it's kind of like a gem and it shines best under the light of forgiveness. And yet, we're so conditioned to go in there with our, our, our fists up and uh, I'm going to intimidate you into compliance with my will. And it doesn't work. There's a, uh, I read a thing in law. It says that a child, an infant, has rights. An, uh, an adolescent will have freedoms. An adult has duties. We will go into court and argue about our rights versus someone who is claiming a duty, and we lose all the time, and then we say, oh, the courts are unfair. But if you go in there claiming a duty that surpasses the other's duty and what you're doing instead of securing your own rights, you accept the duty to secure your neighbor's rights, knowing that you will secure the same for yourself. Mm. Now you're coming from a position of you're, you're speaking like an adult and not a child or an infant. Now what's the remedy? Because, yes, all, all of this is happening, but unless you can point to a remedy, um, people tend to duck back. They, they don't want to hear it. And there has to be remedy. I, I, don't see, I don't see the Creator allowing this to happen without there being a fundamental plan and without us having remedy against it. So that's what I try to focus on. Right. And, and I think that remedy, fundamentally, it boils down to 
I don't want to sound woo or overly, you know, religious or anything, but I honestly believe there is only one love. And it's like there's one air that we all breathe. There's one love we all know. You find that common ground. You start knowing who you are in the grand scheme of things. And from there, all of their words become just a big joke. And you can start mm -hmm. laughing at them when they come and bring them at you. I know people right. who've looked at it now and the cops pull them over, they just sit there and give them a big grin and the cops are like, oh, another one. Yeah, I know. Okay, bye. <laughs> you know, they're just you people with words, Charles. They're just yeah. people with words. And we can yeah. be angry at the people or we can just dismiss the words and all you're left with are, are actors playing a role. I had an, a, an instance in Calgary once where the police officer pulled over myself and my friend, Luke Denis, uh, another free man on the land up here, and I asked him, I said, what role are you playing? Are you playing the role of a, a, a law enforcement officer or a peace officer? He got quite angry and insisted that he wasn't playing any role at all. He was working. He's not playing. And yet I then pointed out that right in the police act, in their police act, it uses the word, the terminology, playing two roles. So I said, so clearly you're not going by the police act. And that just took the wind right out of his sails and he left. But I did it not with, you know, anger or anything, but just a big smile and a big grin. And I remember who pulls, a, uh, pulls the curtain away from the Wizard of Oz, eh? It's the puppy, just the yappy puppy. And for the most part, a lot of these people, these are the same people who, who they might give you a ticket and you might hate them one minute, but driving down the road, if they saw you in a ditch and your, your child was in danger, these people would put, be putting their life on the line. They're, they're not your enemy. you got to get to the point where you can educate them and show them that their job is to support you, even against the government and the courts, because these are just people playing roles, and you're not you're not in their theater of operations anymore. Because I think most of them probably go out with a desire to serve and a desire to create better communities. And if you can see them from that perspective, I think that's where a lot of the teachings of Jesus come in. If you can love your enemy, you can see their perspective. If you can see their perspective, you can lead them to yours. But if you refuse to accept their perspective at all, how are you going to get them to yours. I, I, do, I don't even try to think of it like talking them into a trap. I try to show them a path that leads to peace and abundance for everyone. We're talking about your friend. What was her name again? Uh, Chris Titus, and she is with Fathers for Justice. And uh, they focus mainly on uh, obtaining equal access for parents and uh, equal access in the courts. Yeah, that sounds good. I'll, I'll, I'll try to hear her on uh, for on another show. In fact, um, you still have, you have my email, right? Yeah, yeah, I can yeah, uh, definitely put you two in contact, and uh, you'll find a very spirited and very fun woman. Uh, they uh, up here, what they did, they uh, bought a hundred and thirty thousand crickets, and then they huh. brought those into the courts, and they released them in all of the courts. <laughs> so the courts would know that you could silence one voice, but you couldn't silence all of them. They sent these crickets to politicians, and they, uh, they're they jumping all over the place. And uh, some of the politicians were quite impressed. And uh, i got to tell you, every time I hear a cricket, I think of Fathers for Justice. <laughs> well, this is very good stuff. I mean, you, you can't argue your approach from a legal or a common sense standpoint. Uh, it only makes sense to approach these people in a very calm and, and uh, controlled spirit, uh, that, you know. And like you said, look at Jesus. I mean, th here was a man who was uh, hadn't done any wrong. In fact, all he ever did was, was for the good of others, and yet uh, they wanted his head. <laughs> yeah. And he, he never gave them anything to, to, you know, never violated any law, never gave them any reason to uh, be hateful toward him. All he did was tell them the truth, just tell it like it is. And for that, they hated him. Yeah, the people who, do, who uh, rely on deception generally are not too fond of truth speakers. I've had a government agent actually try to use that scripture against me because uh, they thought that it gave them scriptural right to collect taxes. And I said, listen, uh, show me a Caesar. Caesar is someone who could kill you for not paying taxes. Show me the Caesar. And if you can't, then let's concentrate on the key part of that scripture, which is render unto God. And it yeah. set them up pretty quick because we we have no more seizures. I mean, 
Show me the one right. who can kill me for not paying taxes, for not net be kneeling before them or paying tribute. They can't do it. They can't do it lawfully. I have no seizure. I'm going to bring that.